to bow your heads and we'll ask the Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. Our dearest Heavenly Father, Lord, we again want to thank you for the way in which you lead us. Lord, we thank you for Jesus' death on the cross, which has given us the chance for salvation. And Lord, we know that in your word you've given us many warnings. We pray now, Lord, as we study through your word, that you'll help us to appreciate and understand the message, especially as it pertains for us in these last days. So Lord, we invite you to be with us. May your Holy Spirit guide our thoughts and minds as we open your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just by way of introduction, you might have seen on the news recently the Falcon Heavy rocket launched by SpaceX. Did anyone see that on the news just in the last couple of weeks? Yes. Very interesting. And what was interesting is in the nose cone of this, they had a very special payload, a shiny red sports car. And you might have seen this in the news. Elon Musk launched his own car into space. And they put in the, sitting in the driver's seat, a mannequin wearing a spacesuit. And then they launched this on the 6th of February. Amazing rocket. This is the most powerful rocket in the world today. It has 27 engines. It can lift 64 tons into orbit. And the side boosters come back and return. These are not taking off. These are actually landing. You might have seen that on the news. And what was intriguing is when they got the car up in space, it had cameras attached on the side, and they took these amazing shots showing the sports car floating in space with the Earth behind, and as it rotated slowly around, you could see these views of Earth across the bonnet here, and here's one in the background. And slowly this car was drifting off, well not slowly, it's actually going seven kilometres a second, fastest car in the world, and it drifted away, leaving the Earth behind. Now, what was the reaction around the world? And of course, many people thought this is amazing, but there is a large number of people that think just about everything we see today is fake. And so if you get on YouTube and look this up, you find a lot of people saying, this is all a hoax. This is all CGI, computer graphics. And you'll find memes like this, space is fake, flat earth is real. You know, there's an amazing large number of people today believe that the earth is flat. Have you heard that? And there's even funny memes I get, got sent this one about Nicholas Copernicus watching flat earth conspiracy videos on YouTube for five hours and then he says I was wrong. <laughs> and that's the trouble today. There's so many theories out there, what they're called conspiracy theories. If you get on YouTube or on Wikipedia, for example, there's a whole list of conspiracy theories. And they describe here about unproven conspiracy theories, such as that the moon landings were a fake and all this sort of thing. You've probably seen all this on the news. They do make an interesting comment here. It says they're not to be confused with research concerning verified conspiracies, such as Germany's pretense for invading Poland in World War II. So Wikipedia acknowledges there are conspiracy theories which are true. But you know, if you base your information on YouTube or on Wikipedia or on the media, will we ever come to the truth? Because there's so many conflicting theories out there, isn't there? If you take a position on something, you get on the internet, you'll find somebody who opposes that view. So what's the best source of information today? Somebody said, yes, the Bible. We have to go back to the Word of God. And if we rely, rely on that, the <clears throat> Sorry about that. We're on safe ground. So we want to look this morning at what is the Bible saying? What is the conspiracy theory the Bible tells us about that's going to deceive the world? Now you might recall Jesus when he was talking to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. They asked him about the end of the world. And notice what Jesus says when they asked him the question, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And the first thing Jesus said was this in verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. The very first thing Jesus says was, Take heed that no one deceives you. Down in verse 11, he says, Many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. There's that word deceive again. 
And down in verse 24, he says, For there shall arise false Christs, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, the implication being that it's not possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So where does all this deception come from? And Jesus spelled it out very plainly. But back in John chapter 8, verse 44, the devil, he said, abode not in the truth, because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And even the book of Revelation, it talks about that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. So who does he deceive? Basically everybody. Also, Satan has some accomplices. For example, Babylon. It says that great city Babylon, by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And this Babylon city has an accomplice. It says the beast that was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast. So we find here, the beast and the false prophet are going to be those that are going to deceive the world, and ultimately deceive them that received the mark of the beast. Now what's going to happen to Satan as a result of all his deceptions? Satan, it says, is going to be cast into a bottomless pit and shut him up, it says. And they're going to set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little seat. So Satan is going to be locked away so he won't be able to deceive. But what will happen at the end of that thousand years? It says, he shall go out to deceive the nations which were in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for battle. So even after he's been locked up for a thousand years, Satan is again going to go out to deceive the nations. And finally, his doom is this. It says, the devil that deceived them, here's this deception coming in again, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So we know there's going to be a lot of deception in the last days. The whole world is going to be deceived according to Bible prophecy, except the elect. And we want to be part of that, don't we? So who's going to rule the world? What are the powers that Satan's going to use to lead the world into deception? That's what we're going to look at this morning, a brief, a brief Bible study. And we find the two powers, the key powers that are going to deceive the world, depicted in Revelation chapter 13. There's this beast that comes out of the sea and a beast that comes out of the land. And the Bible tells us, regarding this first beast, it says, All the world wondered after the beast. So the whole world is going to wonder at this entity, whatever it is. It says, Power is given him over all kindreds, tongues and nations in verse 7. So this is going to be a powerful entity. And ultimately, verse 8, it says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Now this power has an accomplice, and we read about that in verses 11 through to the end, and it says, this second power, the second beast, exercises all the power of the first beast. He does great wonders, it says, such that he makes fire come down from heaven. He's the one that's going to say to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to that first beast. And then he causes all to receive a mark. So we're going to look this morning at who these powers are, who these beasts represent. And first of all, we're going to look at that first beast, the beast from the sea. And we find this depicted in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. John, it says, stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now why should we be worried about this beast? Why should we be concerned? It's because this beast has a mark and in chapter 14 God has this warning message, very plain and simple. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand the same shall drink of the wine 
of the wrath of God. This is a life and death issue. So we need to understand who this beast is and what this image is all about. And this is the warning that God's given us in his word. So let's go through the scriptures now, the texts pertaining to this first beast, and unpack them and see if we can identify who this is. So here comes a beast rising up out of the sea. Now straight away we're on familiar ground. What is a beast in Bible prophecy? If we go back to Daniel chapter 7, chapter 7 of Daniel depicts four beasts coming up out of the sea. And if you go back and do some homework, you'll see these four beasts rise up out of the sea. So here in chapter 13, another beast is rising up out of the sea. And those four beasts in Daniel represented different kingdoms of the world through history. Starting with the kingdom of Babylon, represented by the lion with wings. Then came Medo-Persia. Then came Greece. Then came Rome. So these four beasts depicted different kingdoms throughout history. So here's another beast rising up out of the sea. So here's another kingdom rising up out of a populated area because the sea in Bible prophecy represents, as we read in Revelation 17, peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues. So this is a kingdom rising up in a populated area. Just as these kingdoms rose up in populated areas, when the Medo-Persians conquered the Babylonians, they were conquering peoples and nations. When the Greeks conquered the Medo-Persians, they were conquering peopled areas. And so Daniel gives us the background to what we read in Revelation. You have in Daniel chapter 2 this metal image depicting those same four kingdoms. Chapter 7 has these four animals. And so in chapter 13, this beast that comes up again represents, to be consistent with the Bible prophecy, another kingdom rising up. Now this kingdom, it says, was like a leopard, his feet like the feet of a bear, the mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, seat, and great authority. This sounds very similar to these four beasts depicted here, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and the what could be a dragon. So these four beasts seem to be amalgamated into this one beast here in Revelation chapter 13. And it says the dragon gave him, this beast here, his power, seat, and great authority. So who's this dragon that gave power, seat, and authority to this beast we read in Revelation 13? Well, who was the dragon, if you like, in Daniel chapter 7? It was the empire of Rome, pagan Rome, so to speak. So that would suggest that pagan Rome was going to give its power, seat, and authority to this new entity. And we find the same story in chapter 12 of Revelation. In chapter 12 of Revelation, the dragon, it says, stood before this woman who was ready to give birth. And this is a depiction of the church of Jesus about to bring the Messiah into the world. So this dragon was ready to devour the baby. So how did Satan use pagan Rome to try to devour Jesus when he was born? Remember how Herod sent soldiers to kill all the babies in Bethlehem under the age of two in the hope of destroying the Messiah who he was scared would usurp the throne, you see. So the dragon, that primarily represents Satan, it can represent pagan Rome as well. And what that tells us is this beast in Revelation 13 got its seat, its power and its authority from what we would call the Roman Empire. So there's a big clue straight away. This beast in Revelation 13 got its power, seat and authority from the Empire of Rome. Let's continue on. It says, I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. That's verse 3. So this entity, this power in Revelation 13 was going to get some sort of wound and that wound would be healed and then all the world would wonder after it. So clearly this is a, a worldwide power. It says they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast and they worshipped the beast. 
saying, who's like unto the beast? Who's able to make war with him? So clearly, there is worship involved with this. Can you see that? The Bible clearly depicts worship being involved with this beast power. Verse 5 says, There was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. Oh, so this is a blasphemous power. Whatever it is, it commits blasphemies. Now, what's the biblical definition of blasphemy? Well, in Mark chapter 2, verse 7, Jesus was accused of blasphemy. They said, Who can forgive sins? But God only. If you read the backstory to that, Jesus had just said to a gentleman, Your sins be forgiven you. And the Pharisee says, Oh, he's committed blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Was Jesus committing blasphemy? Not at all, because Jesus was God. He had the power to forgive sins. He came to shed his blood to be able to forgive our sins. If anyone could forgive sins, it was Jesus. But the Jews, not believing he was the Son of God, thinking he was only a man, accused him of blasphemy. So blasphemy in the Bible is for a man to claim to forgive sin. Do you see that? That's what the Bible teaches us. Also, Jesus was accused of blasphemy on another occasion. Here in John chapter 10 verse 33, they said, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Now, was Jesus committing blasphemy? Not at all. He was the Son of God. He was fully divine. But they ac accused him of blasphemy because they thought he was merely a man. So this power in Revelation 13 that commits blasphemies is going to commit blasphemy in thinking it for can forgive sins and claiming to be God. So very clear, isn't it? Now, this power would continue for... 42 months, we read in verse 5. What does 42 months represent? Well, if we use the Bible principle found in Ezekiel 4, 6, each day represents a year. 42 months, and if each month is 30 days, that's 1260 days. But if each day is a year, that's 1260 years. Do you follow the logic there? So this power would reign for 1260 years years. That's a long time. Not many kingdoms ruled for that long. So this should be narrowing it down as to which power this is. Verse 6 talks about how he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. So this power is very blasphemous. It's doubly, doubly emphasized here in the book of Revelation. And it's blasphemy against God, his name and his tabernacle. We'll see if that fits when we discover who this power is. It says it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So this power obviously martyred Christians. Can you see that? This is what the Bible is telling us. And yet in verse 8 it says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. So clearly this is a worldwide power. It's a global entity in its influence and power. And it involves worship. But something's going to happen to this beast. It receives a deadly wound. And we read in Revelation 13 verses 9 and 10. That says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with the sword. So this power which would lead into captivity and kill with the sword would itself have these inflicted upon it. Finally, the Bible tells us, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it's the number of a man, and his number is 666. So with all these clues, it's not difficult to identify who God is telling us to be cautious of in these last days. The beast is a kingdom made up of all these empires in the past. Elements of them merged together. It received power, seat, and authority from the Roman Empire. It would reign for 1260 years. It would receive a deadly wound, which would get healed. It would lead into captivity, but end up being led itself into captivity. It killed with a sword, but itself would be killed by a sword. 
It's a worldwide power, has a mouth speaking great things, claims to forgive sins, for example. It martyred Christians. It's a religious power and has a number of a man, number 666. So tell me, what religious kingdom fits all these specifications? And there's only one, isn't there? God's given us plenty of clues to identify this power that's going to be crucial in the last day of ends. And what we're about to share is nothing new. This is known by many reformers and founders of various denominations. For example, John Wesley. Have you heard of John Wesley? Founder of the Methodists. Here was his comment. You can read these notes. You can look these up online. This is public knowledge. He says, O oh reader, this is a subject wherein we also are deeply concerned and which must be treated not as a point of curiosity, but as a solemn warning from God. The danger is near. This beast is the Romanish papacy. That was his identification. Is that fair? Well, have a look. What about Martin Luther? What did he say? The kingdom of Antichrist is also described in the revelation of John. And this is what we've just looked at. Where it is said unto him, it was given to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. Revelation 13 verse 7. So Martin Luther is quoting that passage here from Revelation 13. And he says of this, We must on investigation understand that of the Pope's abominations and tyranny in temporal respect. So Martin Luther identified this power in Revelation 13 as being the papacy. You know, this power is a counterfeit. When you look at Jesus, and the Bible identifying marks for Jesus, and this entity in Revelation 13, you'll find that this power is counterfeiting Christ's ministry. Jesus was a lamb. This power is a beast, or an animal, so to speak. Jesus rose from water after his baptism to begin his ministry. This power in Revelation 13 also rises out of water. Christ's ministry lasted literally 42 months, three and a half years. This power is going to reign for 42 months, prophetic months. Jesus sits on God's throne. This power sits on the dragon's throne. Jesus died and was resurrected. This power also received a deadly wound and died and was resurrected. Jesus can forgive sin. This power claims to forgive sin. And all who follow Christ will be saved and will worship Jesus. Sadly, the lost who worship this beast worship the wrong, the wrong power, shall we say. So there's only one system that fits all these clues. Were well, Luther, Wesley and other reformers correct when they identified this power as being the, the entity of Rome, the power of the Roman Catholic Church? Well, let's go through the points again and see how it fits very, very well the Vatican. For example, is this power a kingdom in its own right? And here's an interesting quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia. They say, sovereignty over Vatican City is exercised by the Pope and his function as supreme head of the Catholic Church. The 50 or so countries maintaining permanent diplomatic relations with it implicitly recognize its sovereign status. The very fact that countries send ambassadors to the Vatican show that they recognize this power, this church, if you like, as a kingdom, as a, as a sovereign nation. Do you see that? There's no ambassadors to the Dalai Lama, for example, but they send ambassadors to the Vatican. So they recognize the Vatican as a sovereign country in its own right. It's a kingdom. And the Pope is effectively the king of this little kingdom. Now what about the fact that it's made up of those four beasts from, Revelation, from Daniel chapter 7? And here's an interesting quote from a book called The Catholic Spirit by Andre Retiff. He says, In certain respect... She has copied her organization from that of the Roman Empire, has preserved and made fruitful the philosophical institutions of Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, those were Greeks, borrowed from both barbarians and the Byzantine Roman Empire, but always remains herself thoroughly digesting all elements drawn from external sources. 
So here's a historian saying how the Roman Empire, which became the Roman Catholic Church, absorbed those elements from those other nations. How did it receive power from this dragon via Rome? Well, here's an interesting quote. It says, The popes filled the vacant place of the emperors of Rome, inheriting their power, prestige, and titles from paganism. What happened when Constantine moved the empire from Rome to Constantinople, which we call Istanbul today? Basically, the bishop of Rome was left seated on the throne in the vacant place left by Constantine. And so in that way, they inherited their power and their titles in their seat from the Roman Empire. Here's an interesting quote that says, The mighty Catholic Church was little more than the Roman Empire baptized. The very capital of the old Roman Empire became the capital of the Christian Empire. The office of Pontifex Maximus was continued in that of the Pope. One of the titles of the Pope is Pontifex Maximus. And that didn't originate in the Catholic Church, originated with the emperors of Rome. And they just adopted that title from Rome. What about the length of its reign? The Bible says it was given power to continue 40 and 2 months, or 1260 years. Now the church before 538 was a church, but in 538 things changed. The Bishop of Rome became more and more involved in secular affairs. He began passing secular laws and rules. And so it was at about 538 that the church became a kingdom. It controlled secular affairs, affairs as well. So starting in 538, this power began reigning as a kingdom, not just merely a church. And that power was lost in 1798 and we'll look at that in just a second so from 538 when it began to reign in civil respect up until 1798 when that was cancelled that happens to be exactly 1260 years exactly as the prophecy had said that is remarkable absolutely remarkable it was predicted way back in the days of Daniel and the days of John, the 42 months, the 1260 years. So how did it lose its power? In 1798, right on time, a French general called Berthier entered Rome, proclaimed a republic, and basically abolished the papacy in terms of its civil power. The church was still there, but in terms of its civil power, it was taken away. So it began to cease to reign as a kingdom. They actually asked the Bishop of Rome to renounce his power. They said, you renounce your secular power, and he refused. And so he was taken prisoner. And you can look this up on Wikipedia. This is public knowledge. You can see where it says, he was expelled from the Papal States by French troops in 1798 until his death one year later in Valence. He was taken back to France. So in 1798, he was expelled from Rome and the French army abolished their power right on time. And quotes at the time say this, the papacy was extinct. It had no more secular power. Not a vestige of its existence remained. All its lands were confiscated, you see. Its bishop was dying, a captive in foreign lands, and the decree was already announced that no successor would be allowed in his place. Well, of course, they kept electing new bishops of Rome, the new popes, but he had no secular power anymore until something happened. The deadly wound was healed. And this was done under Mussolini. The healing began when they were given some land back. Mussolini signed a deal with the Vatican to give back some lands that were confiscated. And it's interesting, up until then, they called it the Roman Question. Rome was saying, we had all our lands taken away, we want them back. And in 1929, this is reported in the San Francisco Chronicle, the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy. And affixing the autographs to the memorable document, healing the wound, interesting language there, healing the wound, extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. So now the Vatican had some land back, and it's now its own sovereign country. It issues its own coins, 
its own passports, its own stamps, it has its own police force. Countries send ambassadors to it. It's now again a sovereign country. So the wound is healing. And if you visit the Vatican, here's a picture I took where you can see you've got the Basilica of St. Peter on the left, straight ahead. But if you want to go to the city-state of the Vatican, you turn right. Do you see that? So here you've got church and state. The Basilica of St. Peter and the city-state of the Vatican. So it's a church and state combined once again. And as the Bible says, all the world wondered after the beast. Do we find that today? Yes, the world pays great homage to this little tiny kingdom, the smallest country in the world. What about the identifying mark that it was speaking great things and blasphemies? Well, here's some quotes from Catholic sources. The Pope has power to change times and abrogate, that means change laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Do you believe that? This is a principle they hold. They believe they have the power to change even what Jesus himself established. That's a fairly great thing to claim, isn't it? It says, There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. They even believe they've changed the times that God established, the Sabbath day. Here's an interesting quote from a catechism. This is a Catholic writer saying, had she not had such power, she could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. And again, this shows the principles that the system works on. They believe they have the power to change things that God established without any scriptural authority. And that's what makes it this blasphemous power. Very serious. Here's some other interesting quotes from a Catholic source. The Pope is supreme judge of the law of the land. He is the vice regent of Christ and is not only a priest forever, but also king of kings and lord of lords. Now tell me, who has the title in the Bible, king of kings and lord of lords? Jesus. Exactly, you said it, Jesus. How could a man adopt that title? That's blasphemous, folks. Sorry about that. But that's a title that only belongs to Jesus, not to any human being. Do they claim to be able to forgive sins? Yes, they certainly do. Here's a quote from a, a catechism. Does the priest truly remit, that means forgive sins, or does he only declare that they're remitted? The priest does really and truly remit the sins in virtue of the power given him by Christ. They believe they have the actual power to do what only the blood of Jesus can do, and that is cleanse people of sin. That, dear folks, is blasphemous. And here's another one. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. Now you think that sounds a bit strange. But you know, this is... A common thought within Catholicism. For example, John Paul II, that well-known Pope, wrote a book called Crossing the Threshold of Hope. You can see it here by His Holiness John Paul II. And in this book he makes an interesting statement. He's quoting a journalist and he publishes it in his book and this is what it says. Confronted with the Pope, one must make a choice. The leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as the vicar of Jesus Christ and is accepted as such by believers. Now notice this statement. The Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God and who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. Do you see what that's saying? He's saying he stands in the place of Jesus. Who's the second person of the Trinity? It's Jesus. So this is saying the Pope takes the place of Jesus. It's interesting that phrase here, takes the place of. And that's quoted word for word from John Paul II's book. Because in Greek, what is the Greek word for taking the place of? It's the word anti. In Greek, the word anti is the word for taking the place of. 
in Christos is Christ. So when we read in Greek anti-Christos or in English anti-Christ, what's it referring to? That word anti and anti-Christ literally means taking the place of. And we find that here in Matthew chapter 2 verse 22. This is talking about Joseph when he was going to come back to Israel with baby Jesus. And it says, when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, having been warned in a dream, and he withdrew to the district of Galilee. So Joseph heard that Archelaus was reigning in the place of his father Herod. Now that word in place of is translated from that Greek word anti. So antichrist literally means in the place of Christ. Do you see that? People have a concept that antichrist is some sort of nasty entity with horns that's opposing Jesus openly. No, antichrist means in the place of Christ, a substitute for Christ. And this is what the Vatican claims to be. The Pope claims to be in the place of Christ. He's literally calling himself antichrist in his own words. Here's another interesting quote. Indeed, the excellence and power of the Roman pontiff is not only in the sphere of heavenly things and earthly things and those of the lower regions, but even above the angels than whom he himself is greater. Is this blaspheming those that dwell in heaven? Yes, it is. Just as the prophecy said he'd blaspheme those that dwell in heaven, the Pope claims authority even over angels. Amazing. Now this power in Revelation 13, it says, would make war with the saints. And here's an interesting quote. The church has persecuted. The Donatists were persecuted and sometimes put to death. We have always defended the Spanish Inquisition. When she thinks it good to use physical force, she will use it. That's a quote from a Catholic source saying the church, when it sees fit, is happy to use force. In fact, here's a quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia. This is from a Catholic source. It says, Torture was little used from the 9th to the 12th centuries. In 1252, Pope Innocent IV sanctioned the infliction of torture by the civil authorities upon heretics. And torture came to have a recognized place in the procedure of the inquisitor inquisitorial courts. So here there's a Catholic Encyclopedia saying, Torture has a recognized place. And its methods. That's why we saw what we saw during the Dark Ages. Such horrible things were done because they believed it was acceptable to do this. Now the worry is this. This prophecy talks about that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So don't we want our names written in that Lamb's book of life? Absolutely. Now what about the number 666? How does that apply to this power here? Here's the verse from Revelation 13. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it's the number of, notice this, a man. And his number is 666. So how does this apply to the papacy? All the other clues apply to the papacy perfectly. This one has to as well. So if it doesn't, we haven't identified the right power, have we? But if all points fit, then we've identified the right power. So how does this power fit the papacy? Well, let's unpack this verse a little bit more. It says, let him that has understanding count the number of the beast. Now that word in Greek is used twice in the Bible. One is here in Revelation 13. The other is when Jesus said this, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he may have enough to finish it. So what does that word count mean? It literally means add up or tally up. Do you see that? If you're going to build a tower, you first add up the cost and see if you can afford to do it. That's what Jesus is saying. And that same word count there is the same word in Revelation 13. It literally means to tally up or add up. So how do we add up the number of the beast? Well, the Bible tells us in Revelation 13, verse 17, that it's the number of his name. So there's the clue. 
what we have to do is count the number of the name of the man of the beast power because it's the number of a man it's the number of his name and this is the man of the beast power so do you follow that we need to count the number of the name of the man of the beast power and we should get 666 do you follow the logic there so what's the title or the name of the Bishop of Rome and here's a quote from a Catholic source what are the letters inscribed on the Pope's crown and what do they signify if anything and the answer was the letters inscribed on the Pope's mitre are these vicarious filii dei which is Latin for vicar of the Son of God now in English we use the word vicarious are you familiar with that you can vicariously do something which means you can do it in place of that's literally saying in place of the Son of God it's almost like another title for Antichrist and it's also turned into the word vicar someone can be a vicar you might have heard of that term now is that title used today and again you can check this out yourself at home with an internet connection if you go to the Vatican website and look up some of the documents written by the, the popes the bishops of Rome here's one written you there's the reference at the top you can see this this is from Pope Paul the and in their documents they introduce themselves as the Bishop of Rome the head of the church and you can see the translation here the honorable vicar of God's son and caretaker which by divine will has been eternally given the highest rank in the Holy Church so the Pope is introducing himself there and but if you look at the original Latin can you see this it's got Adirandi De filio vicarius. There it is, vicarius filio dei, vicar of the Son of God. So there it is, as a title that the popes use, introducing themselves on their own website. And here's another example too. This is also Paul the Sixth, and here he's using the plural version. He's talking about. You can see the translation it says, "Vicars of the Son of God." He's talking about the bishops of Rome as a plural group, and you can see here it is. Vicarii, that's the plural version, filii dei, on earth. Literally saying the vicars of God's Son on earth. So it's a title they use, and you can see it in their documents. So if we take the letters, and as you know, in Roman numerals, are so basically Roman letters, V is 5, I is 1, C is 100, A has no value, R has no value, etc., etc., that title adds up to what's the number we're looking for? 666 and it adds up now that's not the only clue to identify this system as you can see there's all the other points match but even this one matches as well so the bottom line is the only power that fits all of these clues is the papacy there are some other powers that might fit one or two of these identifying marks, but not all of them. There's only one that fits all of them, and it's the papacy. So the beast power, that people say one day the, there's going to be a beast power rise. No, it's already here. It's been here for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now this power in the past had enormous influence. It used to crown the heads of Europe. Here's a painting showing Pope Leo III crowning the king of France for example they had enormous power and influence over Europe and they would like that power back again <laughs>